Um, Sasha Suda was on our team here as head of European art. She's been working on this show for about three years, and about five months ago, we were thrilled when she had the opportunity to take over our National Gallery as their director. Um, I think many of us know Sasha. We can't, yes. I should say one of the great pleasures of her leaving us has been that Sasha and I have really truly become colleagues and that is um, just hugely rewarding. So enough about Sasha, come on up and tell us what you know. Hi, it's so great to be back. Um, I, you know, and Stefan can't say this, but this show couldn't have happened without the commitment of the AGO to make it happen. Um, he made a sort of an allusion to the amount of work that we did early on chasing loans and running around, and I just, I can't understate how much of a reality that is. And in fact, before I even was able to do that myself, because I was either pregnant with twins or on maternity leave with twins, there were people working with us to get the ball rolling, and I want to point those people out. First of all, my co-curator, Kirk Nickel, if you can stand up so everyone can see you. Couldn't have happened without you. And next to him, David Jaffe, who did a lot of that running when I wasn't going anywhere. David. David is the foremost scholar on Rubens and has been a huge ally to us on this project. Corinne Chong. Corinne, where are you? Corinne's been the research assistant on the project. And Caroline Shields, who's since taken over uh, my old post. Caroline, where are you? She's been a huge help also. She's in the back helping to install the show with incredible uh, foresight and leadership as a 19th century person moving into the world of giant paintings, um, giant religious paintings at that. So it is such a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to kind of take you on a journey through the show with me. So I wanted to start um, with the concept of the show, early Rubens. You know, this show is about Peter Paul Rubens' career from roughly 1610 to 1620. We start a little bit earlier than 1610, but the whole notion of the show is the part of his career where after going to Italy to study as, as a young man and early on in his painting career, he comes back to his hometown to basically set roots and create, be part of creating a new economy that hinges on the arts and to build what becomes the most prolific artist, artistic workshop in the history of art. I mean, we know Rubens because we all know the term Rubenesque, so even if you don't know Rubens, you know what that means. And then fortunately, Renoir picks that up and gets all the hate later. But that started with Rubens, right? So he has become such a, such a cornerstone within the history of art and contributed so much to how we look at painting um, that we wanted to focus on this period of time where he was really starting out and what we think of as his formative career. And fortunately, now we have Eve here, a resident of Flanders, citizen of Flanders, and of Antwerp in particular. Antwerp was an equal protagonist in this exhibition. Without Antwerp, Rubens wouldn't have had the sex success he had, and I would argue that without Rubens, Antwerp wouldn't be where it is today. So this is deadly stuff, right? Everybody says, never start with a map. <laughs> but one of the worst things about studying Rubens is that if you don't get into the political history, it's really almost impossible to understand what was at stake and why what he did matters so much. So you're looking at a map of the Low Countries, right, 1477, and this is the beginning, and it's what we call, basically, you're looking at France, modern-day Belgium, and, and, and Holland, the Netherlands, and this is mostly, at this point already, controlled by um, the French Empire and by the Burgundian uh, kings, right? And that comes into flux when one of the Burgundian um, princesses, let's call them, or, or you know, the heir apparent, but a woman, marries a member of the Habsburg family, then the Roman emperors. And so the north, this part of, the, of Europe, becomes part of the Holy Roman Empire. And around 1576, 
it gets split, the Holy Roman Empire. Part of it gets given to the, to the emperor's brother, Ferdinand, and the other part gets given to his son, Philip, who lives in Spain. So he's suddenly the Spanish king in charge of the northern part of Europe. He spends some time there, but he ends up going back to Spain. And the tension is clear, as you can see through this series of maps, because of basically religious conflict. The Spanish Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, is, is inherently Catholic, of course. And there's been in the north really strong anti-church sentiment in the form of the Protestant movement. Basically a critique or scrutiny of how the church spends money, portrays its ideas through art, um, its use of seductive imagery, etc. And that, that sentiment is strong in the North, right? It starts with Martin Luther. It's been kind of brewing even before that. And then you have this Catholic rule come in. And as you can see, over a very, very short period of time, it creates basically religious segregation. The Catholics stay south, the Protestants go north, and ultimately, in 1648, it's acknowledged that the North, the Dutch Republic, is separate, and the South then, the Spanish Netherlands, are Catholic. And so it's, this separation wasn't easy. There was incredible warfare the whole time, conflict that you can't imagine. It's written about extensively, but that's the backdrop for Rubens' growing up. It's the backdrop for him coming back to Antwerp. And Antwerp, as you can see on this map, it's you know lovely to choose a map that doesn't label Antwerp, in fact. Um, <laughs> good choice. Good choice, Suda. Uh, I have some other things on my mind. <laughs> um, but you can see on this map, the earlier map, that there it is, right? It's a port city. And in the medieval and renaissance period, we might generally think that Venice was the gateway to the world. That's how goods from elsewhere around the globe came to Europe. That into the 15th century moves to the north. And it moves first to Bruges, and after a period of time, it moves indeed to Antwerp. And Antwerp enjoys that. But the warfare that ensues over the period that these maps cover creates trouble in Antwerp, and it goes through a demise, which I'll talk about later. But that is the very general, like, sort of Cole's Notes uh, version of what's going on behind the scenes. So this is Antwerp, as you can see it here, and Rubens doesn't actually, isn't born there. He's born in Germany, and he's born in Germany because there are already these religious tensions going on. And he leaves um, as a result of those because of his parents, and he ends up coming back only later as a young man. And this is an example of the level of violence that ensues, you know, in this case, 1585. It's quite intense. So this is Rubens, just 12 years later, coming back to the city, and he goes on to study in Italy. He's entered into the Painters Guild in Antwerp. He's doing well. He does not come from a family of painters or from great privilege, but he's clearly good. He's imitating somebody like Hans Holbein here. And then he goes on to Italy, and he sees the great works of antiquity, the Laocon, and I use this one purposely because it had been discovered not long before Rubens came to Rome. So there was this rediscovery of antiquity already going on in Italy that he was becoming a part of. And quotations from this sculpture in particular make it into his paintings time and time and time again. Of course, he also gets to experience his contemporary Caravaggio. You know, Caravaggio completely sort of upends this sort of high renaissance and introduces a kind of human scale, in this case, three-quarter figure, um, really heart-wrenching artwork that's known for chiaroscuro, or the contrast between light and dark. And all of this is tied in to kind of the revitalization of the church, or what I would call the rebranding of the Catholic Church, which, of course, would have its epicenter in Rome because all of that critique that was happening in the north and then disseminating throughout Europe really did hurt the church. And the, hurt, the church realized it did have to come back um, and rebrand itself. And Caravaggio was a big part of that, of refurbishing churches and making Catholicism present to people on a human scale and one that pulled on your heartstrings. And then finally, of course, he was able to see Michelangelo. And Michelangelo figures 
figures quite well into the story. And all of the works that you've seen start to nod to, to Rubens' obsession with human anatomy and that kind of interest in the form and what lies beneath the surface of the skin. So it's those things that he sees in Italy and it's that period that we reference in the first very yellow room. Um, and you can see the impact that it has in some of his early work while he's still in Italy. This, the fall of Phaeton, which you can see in the National Gallery of Washington. So they let us choose one. This one's a lot smaller than Daniel in the Lion's Den, so that's the one we chose. Um, and uh, that's sometimes what it comes down to. But this is an extraordinary work, and you can see thinking about Michelangelo, thinking about Caravaggio, how this would be interesting to Rubens and how he might translate it um, in with his old style, which you saw at the beginning was quite stiff, right? And based on something completely different. In the galleries here, the first work that you'll encounter is this image of the story of Hero and Leander. So Hero was a priestess who lived, lived in a tower and Leander and Hero fell in love, but of course that love was forbidden and every evening, Leander would swim across the water, that the strait that divided these two characters, and they would have their encounter. And one night, the wind was blowing very hard, and the waves were quite high, as it's told by Ovid, and the light that Hero was using to beckon Leander and help him find his way blew out because of that wind, and Leander died in the water on his way, and you can see that his body is already almost blue, right? It's minutes after his death. And what Rubens does, which is so Rubens, is he adds a little bit of spice to the story. Of course, in the story that Ovid tells in the poem, Hero does plummet to her death, but it's only a day later when she sees the body. Here he makes it all happen at once to make it a kind of cause and effect. And that's the thing that you'll find about Rubens again and again in the show, is that he ups the drama and he has no fear of how offended or how shocking the story might be um, because that's the whole point for him. And you see that early formation of storytelling at this stage in the galleries. So in 1609, he's been named court painter in Mantua. He has all the reason in the world to stay in Italy, but he comes home. And he comes home, frankly, because his mother is not well. And he has hesitation about coming home because there's all this conflict. And so he shows a really early interest in that conflict. You can read it in his diaries. He has no desire to live in a place where people are being slaughtered in the streets. He has no desire to be living in a place where religious warfare is the backdrop for daily life. But he does end up staying and he becomes court painter for the Archduke of Austria, Albert VII and his wife, Isabel Clara. So it's interesting, right? He jumps right into it. And this is this, you know, these are the Habsburg sort of rulers of that region. And what he's able to negotiate early on in that period is that he can paint for them and other people too. So he doesn't actually execute too many commissions for these rulers early on. He doesn't have to live with them, you know? He doesn't have to do a lot of the things a typical court painter would have to do, and that's, a sort of early indication that he's something special, right? And so he carries on into Antwerp and he marries Isabella Brandt. And here you see them in our favorite, one of our favorite paintings of this period, the Honeysuckle Bower. And believe me, I traveled to, to Munich three times to try to borrow this painting. And I think David Jaffe did a lot of diplomacy on behalf of trying to move the curator in Munich, but they don't like to move their paintings between Munich and Nuremberg. So it seemed like a, an effort in vain in the end anyways. So, um, but it's, it's a painting that I have to, to share with you because it shows that he has these ambitions, right? It has ambitions, class ambitions, societal ambitions, and he sees himself as part of the patron class. One of his contemporaries, and I think this is a really interesting um, poem, it says, Belgium is the world's ring, and the jewel of this ring is Antwerp. This is the Antwerp that Rubens is returning to. It's a contemporary. Belgium is the world's eye, and the pupil of the eye is Antwerp. Belgium is the world's paradise, and the pleasure of this paradise is Antwerp. Belgium is the world's heaven, and the sun of this heaven is Antwerp, written by Carlo Scribani, 
great intellectual um, who was living in Antwerp at the time. So the Antwerp that Carlos Grabani is writing about is actually one that you can see in these 16th century panels that hang downstairs. This is the Antwerp that was enjoying all of that wonderful um, wealth and trade and it was the gateway to the world. By the time Rubens had come to Antwerp, the canal, the river that was joining the harbor from Antwerp to the North Sea, the way that these traders would get their import and export, had been destroyed. You couldn't do that anymore. The merchants had left. The meeting of all these cultures and people in this one city was over. So what was Scribani on about? Well, I would argue, you know, this is, this is really the, the world that's sort of the post-conflict world that Rubens went into was a, was a result of the sack of Antwerp, which was a rebellion of those Spanish shoulders, soldiers who were keeping guard of the city. So what was Scribani on about? Why was Rubens committing to the city? Well, there were people there who were equally as committed. His brother Philip had been like him for a long time in Italy, he had been more established in Italy, a great intellectual, neo-Stoic, a thought leader who had basically brought Rubens to Italy and then had come back after he had as well. And this beautiful portrait of Philip you can find in the galleries downstairs. And Michael Fovius, a Dominican, um, who similarly, like Rubens, sort of surprisingly, was a diplomat, somebody who was joining the anti-war movement, who was very much part of this fight to end conflict and also to reestablish Antwerp and to invest in its revitalization. You can see that one in the galleries. It's at the Moritz House, from the Moritz House in The Hague. And really the epicenter for the dialogue between all of these people and Rubens' own activity as an artist came and happened in the Rubens House, which he bought and developed some years after he arrived. So in the first couple of years, he was painting either in situ or elsewhere. And then the activity shifted to his house. And here you can see on the left an engraving um, from several centuries ago, and on the right a photograph from today. And I can assure you this is one of the most special places in the world that you can visit. It is an extraordinary place to experience how an artist lived and worked. His studio is still there. The massacre was on view there not long ago. And just going into that studio space and imagining how an artist could be this prolific and productive with as many artists as he worked in that space is pretty, pretty amazing. So we've covered the fact that he's, you know, he's becoming a great artist. He's an emerging diplomat, and he's an extraordinary entrepreneur to make this all come together. Um, and also obviously financially responsible because he's bought a house. Uh, in Toronto, that means a lot. So <laughs> let's just guess that in Antwerp, even though property values might have been down, um, he was making good investments. So the next gallery is about kind of, he's making these steps, but what really creates a career for him? So during these violent outbursts, of course, not, um, no church remains unscathed, right? The art that's in those churches is, is part of the conflict, is part of the critique. And so you can see here an image from 1566 by Franz Hogenberg, one of the very few kind of, let's say, source images for how iconoclastic activity took place, i.e. the destruction of art. You can see that it's, it's quite visceral and um, real damage took place. The guys with the bats on the left, the kind of like clock, clockwork orange duo in the streets is particularly um, resonant for me and I wonder if that has any connection to the movie because it's, it's sort of heart-wrenching to know what kind of damage they can do. So when Rubens came, there was art to be made. You know, there was a counter-reformation. The church was rebranding itself. Antwerp was the center of the southern Netherlands. And you could see for this movement, and you could see that they needed new furnishings. This altarpiece was one of the very early and most important kind of, I say, sort of cornerstones of Rubens' early career. And just to give you a sense of scale, that's a, like a real-sized human in front of the painting. <laughs> You know, I would guess she's like maybe five, six. So uh, not even my head touches the bottom of the compositional frame. I mean, it's extraordinary. 
So this is a painting that was made for the St. Walburga Church, which no longer exists, but you can see this triptych in the Antwerp Cathedral. It's the only place you'll ever see it because all of those panels are made of wood and it cannot travel. Um, so you, I really encourage you to go see that because every figure in that painting is human scale or larger and it's unbelievable. So this painting was made possible not just by Rubens, but by those who could help support it being made and again, support his career. So in this case, Cornelis van der Geest, who becomes a really very important patron for Rubens, but had for many, many years been collecting art himself. And downstairs you can see we have a blow up of a painting that shows the gallery in his own home. And there are famous, famous works from museums around the world that you can find in that painting that once were in the center of Antwerp. Just to give you a sense of how St. Walber Walburga Church originally looked, here is a view from a, from a colored um, work on paper. And you can see the altarpiece all the way from the back of the church. That was the point, that that drama just became greater and greater as you approached it. We happen to have the oil sketch for that after that painting. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but this oil sketch from 1638 entered our own collection here at the AGO in 16, in 16, in 1928. I knew there was a 28 there. So 1928. And I think for me, you know, I have no proof because he didn't write it anywhere in his diaries, but that there's this moment late in his career, you know, two years before he dies, where he's looking back at the early career and he recognizes the importance of Cornelis van der Geest and he goes back, he sketches that altarpiece, makes it a, a single frame, wider frame image, and he makes this sketch for a print. And the print, which was made in very few multiples, was dedicated to Cornelis van der Geest. So it's interesting bookends to that story through this work of art, um, which has been in this collection since 1928. And I'll just add the fun bit which is that in the 50s, now that I don't work here, I can talk about it publicly, it was stolen twice. You know, so fascinating. I mean, it was in the newspaper, so it's more or less public, but stolen once, found rolled up in a trash can in Queens Park, and then stolen for a second time and rolled up and found in a trash can in Parkdale, which is where I lived. So um, that, that's just like astounding to me. And one of the headlines in, in the city newspaper at that time was, thieves have better taste in art than the director himself, who has just bought three horrendous abstract modernist pieces that no one will ever understand. So. <laughs> I just thought, I should have lived then, you know? <laughs> Would have been greater friends with the comms team. But uh, anyways, again, just to give you a sense of scale. So going from this monumental scale of over 20 feet tall to this quite intimate scale of a print that you could carry with you uh, if you have a large portfolio, um, quite astounding. And just to give you a sense of what Rubens brings to the table in this particular commission, this figure, life-size, you can kind of see him in the blue drapery there. When it's up that high above you, it's hurtling out at you. I mean, it's unbelievable. Nobody did that before. You know, Rubens is playing with the viewer, confronting the viewer, and it's incredible. Also in this, in this gallery is this wonderful triptych, funerary triptych for the Michielsens, who were a kind of a societal family in, in, in Antwerp at that time, giving you a sense that at the same time as Rubens is doing major church commissions, he's also working for, for patrons who want his work to commemorate their own lives. And this particular work, uh, Kirk can, I think, agree with me, was one of the biggest challenges because three pieces hinged um, made of wood, very hard to travel, never traveled before, and in fact had to undergo quite a conservation treatment before they came here. And this is where I think you start to see the viscerality and Rubens' fearlessness, you know, with taking on mortality. Um, the skin is blue, his pallor is blue, nothing like his wife Isabella Brandt or his brother Philip where have rosy cheeks. I mean, he takes the life out of this figure and the blood even underneath his nose 
is crusted. It's sort of, it stands up from the surface of the painting. It's visceral and it's real and it's tough and it's really interesting to see. And you can see it with a Getty work and a Borghese work from Rome and from LA respectively that show you how he plays with this idea of mortality and pushes it to its limits. And of course we have it in the corner here with uh, image from LACMA with a painting from LACMA of the Holy Family and you know this kind of sense that as soon as Christ is born you know he's dying and um, he explores that even this happy scene of the family has a, a little bit of a almost demonic sense to it you know that darkness which he really brings to all of his painting in this early period. So in our next gallery we really look at printmaking and when we talk about how does Rubens become a household name it's not on his own, and, and Antwerp is really one of his partners in this because it is connected to the rest of the world. And for that reason, or it was connected, and it becomes connected again, it has this incredible printmaking company that was formed by Christophe Plantain, who came from Paris, which was the bookmaking center of the 14th and 15th centuries, and into the 16th century. He moves to Antwerp, his trade moves to Antwerp, and then his son-in-law, a really old you know, school friend becomes the, the son-in-law of Plantin, so it becomes Plantin Moritis Press, and Rubens becomes really, really close with them and works hard to disseminate images throughout the world. And amongst those things that they print are books, of course, because this is the early book period, and a revitalized church needs new books. And so those books travel as far as Latin America, and we have collections, rich collections of Rubens's works on paper that are coming to the market from all over the world, and it's fascinating to see how successful he was in doing that. You can go and see it today. Um, my understanding is that the family that ran the printing press allowed the city to take it over, so it never was had to be refurbished or revitalized. It's recently been reinstalled, the museum part, but. This is where all that work happened and it's extraordinary. So also on view is the print that came after the oil sketch that we have. And that's here, it's on loan from the Rijksmuseum. It's pretty much true to size for the sketch and it gives you a sense of how the two things relate to one another. You can imagine Rubens sending a studio assistant over to the church to sketch it and then him finishing it and this being the end product. Pretty amazing. In that gallery you'll also find some amazing things going on. So on the left, the two proprietors of Baroque claviers, or claviers Baroque, and on the right, two uh, musicians who are playing harpsichords, which were you know, the instrument of choice in the 17th and 18th century. And in fact, Antwerp was the city that made the most harpsichords uh, in that time producing between 25 or 35 and 60 harpsichords in a given year, if you can imagine that. And we've teamed up or partnered luckily with uh, the pop star, classically trained pop star Owen Pallett, who has created a selection of works by Julius Eastman, a very um, underrepresented and not well-known uh, composer from Harlem from the mid 20th century and you have, who's now really having his day. So you have this sort of star that shone 400 years ago and one that's finally starting to shine come together in the harpsichords and you really feel that kind of visceral soundtrack to the show as they play them there. In the next gallery, we really think about storytelling. So a big part of what Rubens did is he didn't really think about convention. He didn't care. There had been a lot of rules in how you tell a story in the Catholic Church and in, in Christian painting and Rubens broke a lot of those rules. And in fact, sometimes when he made prints in, with his new ways of telling those stories, we call that iconography, the way that you tell a particular story from the Bible, it was a good way to disseminate his way of telling the story so it was kind of um, almost like a copyright for him that he owned that new way of telling the story. And I got to listen to David Jaffe talk about these two works yesterday. And what was fascinating is that there's this progression, as he says, in how he works through the problem of telling a story. On the left, the capture of Samson, it's so dramatic, right? There's movement. It's all about the violence of that moment. And on the right, he moves to the next phase. These are both preparatory sketches for a painting that hangs in the National Gallery of London. 
which unfortunately couldn't come here because it had been here in 2008 and couldn't travel again to Canada because uh, it's painted on wood. Um, but we, we have these two next to each other for the first time and you could see that he moves to a totally different way of telling the story, right? He doesn't have to resort to the violence, he, but what he presents is something that's almost more implicitly violent. She's lying to him, right? He, we all know what's gonna happen, he doesn't. She's comforting him in a sense, but we all know what the next part of the story is and you don't need, you know, there's that dramatic irony where you become complicit in the story, which I think is so incredible about Rubens. And here you also see his incredible interest in light and the source of light, where it's coming from and in darkness. So that interest from, from Italy really persists. Uh, but you see it turn into something else in the second version. This painting, which is completely uh, new to the sphere, it came to market only a few years ago, of Lot and his daughters, I think, does the same thing. I mean, this is, this is one of those really tough Old Testament stories, right, where um, angels come to, to Lot's house in Sodom, and then the Sodomites come and try to take the angels out, and... Lot gives away his daughters, and then he's left with two, and then they have to flee, and then his wife turns into a pile of salt, and these things make very little sense. And then you try to recount that by reading the Wikipedia page before your lecture, and you've been studying it for 20 years. Um, but the, the end game of this story is that man, the, the Sodomites are facing extinction, right? They, you know, they, they may not exist. God has kind of put a plague on the city. He's, he's eradicated Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Lot retreats to a cave with two of his daughters and their only hope is to procreate, to continue the race. So it's a story of incest and it's, it's not an easy one. It's one that was popular at this time, likely because of its erotic overtones. But you see again, none of the violence of that story that I just, um, I'm not gonna say told, but kind of made reference to, uh, but you see the daughter with the blue dress. There's something there in the deceit, you know, in the underlying deceit and darkness of it that makes it a, a tough, even tougher story because at first it seems like it might be, uh, might be a, almost a good one, but indeed it's not. And that's, that's Rubens' ability to bring that kind of darkness into the narrative, in my view. And in the last gallery, we really tried to pay homage to the fact that Rubens reinvented the Baroque kind of brought what he learned in Italy together with his own roots as a painter in Northern Europe, a kind of, I would say, somebody described it to me as an earthier painter, um, to create something that had never been created before. And so much of that is about scale. Daniel in the Lion's Den is a work that, you know, Kirk and I made the trek to Washington fully assuming that we would not be allowed to borrow this painting but shocked that they believed in the thesis of the show and really felt that it needed to be in the context, especially of, of the massacre, to understand it better. And it gives you a sense also of Rubens' incredible ability to scale these stories up in a way to create more drama. And again, you know, coming out of the story of Lot and his daughters to this story of Daniel, kind of not sure what's gonna happen, that terror, right? And, if it were live action, I don't know that I would want to be there unless I had known that it, that it ends well for him. So he invests a lot in, in that tension and we really believe that's part of what Rubens brings to the Baroque. One of the tougher paintings in the whole show is the head of Medusa and a real coup to have in the exhibition. There's a version of this painting at the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna which is one of their great treasures. And you know, Stefan and I made the journey out there to, uh, to appeal this loan. And on that trip, we did successfully appeal something else, mostly because a lot of our audience is under 30, uh, which they found great. Um, so the scholarly piece was less interesting to that lender. And in this case, the curator just said, it's on panel, it's worth so much, uh, we can't, but you might try uh, the Moravian Gallery in Brno. And, you know, Kirk really drove this loan. And I, you know, you know I, my mom is here, so I speak Czech thanks to my mom uh, committing to that. My dad is here too. So we were able to negotiate this loan, 
with a little bit of, uh, well, great work on Kirk's behalf of reaching out and sharing the premise and with me greasing the wheels a bit in their language uh, in Brno. And about a month before the show opened in San Francisco, actually it was announced that through scientific research, this painting was actually the first version and that the Vienna version was a copy. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, kind of like serendipity always that comes through on these things and uh, it was really a thrill to have that happen and to have it launch in San Francisco uh, was pretty great and the curators were fantastic to work with. And I just wanted to show that again, sources, right? Caravaggio also painted a Medusa and you just think about Rubens takes it that extra mile, right? And adds a lovely landscape in the back left corner that you almost don't see because you're so focused on the maggots coming out of her neck. But there's also the proud, like hilarious little lizard in the front bottom left corner who kind of doesn't seem to care what they're doing. He's like, look at me, um, great painting. And finally, the massacre of the innocents. So this show wouldn't have happened. It couldn't have happened without the massacre. So much about this show was about um, putting the massacre in context, understanding the fact that everything that Rubens learned up until this point in his life went into the massacre. And in the exhibition, you'll find um, my colleagues at the Rubens House and Gillian McIntyre, the interpretive planner, were able to pull out all of those quotations, thanks to David's beautiful book on this particular painting, where every single figure is quoted from some kind of art historical source. And I'm not gonna walk you through it now because you can leisurely experience it in the galleries or buy the book um, that's, that was published uh, in, on the occasion of the Thompson Collection in 2008. Uh, extraordinary, but it's also, one could say, an anti-war painting, right? It's a painting that warns us against kind of what comes out of people trying to hold on to power. And so in this case, you know, Herod is warned that the Christ child is born and that his throne is at risk. And so what does he do? He goes and he, he makes the order to kill um, all the infants that can be found. And so it's in the height of that, you know, completely irrational order that we find ourselves in this painting, fearlessly presented by Rubens without any care for our own inhib inhibitions. Uh, or, or personal circumstances, uh, he makes us take it on, head on, and I think that that's extraordinary. And finally, in the gallery you'll find, we're very excited that we've hung it high for the first time. It was in fact meant to hang above a fireplace, and it was meant to hang above that fireplace in a sort of receiving room in somebody's home. And so if you can imagine a society sort of funny, it's sort of funny, uh, but it's also a society that's very aware, if not having personally experienced that violence themselves, having heard about that violence just in the streets outside of their homes. So it's, um, it's at once, and this is the line that Rubens rides so well, um, something that takes a political stance, but also presents himself as a great painter in the most ambitious way, as a kind of sampler of all that he can do, marketing himself to the world and to his patrons at home. And that's, I think, as I'm finding in Ottawa where art and politics meet, is where really meaningful things happen. And um, I'm going to leave you with that. And thank you for coming and enjoy the show. And it's great.